Welcome back to the Sip and Feast podcast, episode 28. This one is exploring, discussing the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Maybe you've heard of this. Maybe you're an expert on the subject. Maybe it's something that popular culture has, you know, it's brushed by you and then you just like, I, I don't know what this is. I'm not interested in. One thing I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you probably make seafood for Christmas Eve. And the reason I say you probably do is because supermarkets all across the country will be having in their supermarket flyers specials on seafood going into this time of year. It's just, you know, even though this is based on Roman Catholic tradition, it's something that a lot of other people have taken up. Right, Tara? Yeah. I mean, from my non-expertise in the area, <laughs> um, I do know that in when we were living in Minnesota, uh, in Scandinavian cultures, they do consume seafood on Christmas Eve. I believe lutefisk or lutefisk is the seafood of choice for Christmas Eve. Yeah, I mean, so it's not just an Italian-American thing, though we're going to be bringing you specifically that type of content today. And maybe you do one dish. Maybe you do two dishes. Maybe you're maybe you're 45 years old and you're thinking, you know what? This is going to be the year that I make the seven fishes. That's what we want to go over today. Mm -hmm. So let's do a little, I think, history of this. Let's explore it first. Why did this become a tradition here? It's actually the oldest tradition, Italian-American tradition, right, Tara? Yes. Yes, that's correct. It is referred to as the Feast of the Seven Fishes here in the U.S. amongst Italian-Americans. However, in Italy, it is known as something different. And my understanding is that there is not necessarily seven different fishes consumed. In Italy, it's referred to as la, actually a few different things, la vigilia di Natale, cenone, cena della vigilia di Natale which basically those, any of those three kind of translate into Vigil of the Nativity. So in America, the Feast of the Seven Fishes refers to a day of fasting, Christmas Eve usually, that ends with a meal that does not include meat or dairy. Although I know some of the seven fish dishes that we do consume do include dairy, right? I guess and butter. Butter is dairy. Butter's dairy. Yeah, and there's might a have lot a little, of dishes. A little, little bit of cheese and say like a clams oregano. Yeah. So I don't know how strict folks really are with the dairy part. I know they are more strict with the meat part. There's a wide variety of how strict people are about this. I mean, there are a lot of people, no doubt. Of there's a lot of people who old school Italians who think that the seven fishes is, is like, it's sacrilege if you don't have the seven fishes. Mm -hmm. Like it's really important to them. And it was never like that really in my family. I, I mean, we would always do seafood on Christmas Eve, but, and sometimes we would have more than seven, but it wasn't like we have to have seven. And it definitely wasn't like we have to have a specific seven, mm -hmm. but that is kind of, some people do practice that, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, I was doing some research and found out that, you know, why is there seven, right? That's kind of a question that I think people might be wondering. Um, there's no definitive answer on why there is seven, but there are some theories. One of them is that it could be related to the seven sacraments of Roman Catholicism. It could be related to the creation story in the Bible, being that it took God seven days or actually six days, and then on the seventh day he rested. Um, or another theory is that there's apparently seven hills that surround Rome. So it could be related to that. But either way, that's where the number seven comes from. There's so, also there's seven deadly sins. Seven seems to be a significant yeah. number in Christianity. It definitely does. And one thing I will say is when you do research on this topic, if you do decide to, maybe this is like introducing you to it and you, you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm interested now. I, I want to take this further. There will be tons of conflicting information on this. And 
again, there, there's no real authority on this topic. So essentially, though it's based on Rome, like you're saying, Roman, you know, stuff from Rome, this is a tradition created by Sicilians and Southern, Southern Italian yeah. people who came here mm -hmm. in the late 1800s or to early 1900s. In fact, it actually, that's why I said in the intro that it is the oldest Italian American tradition. There are texts that go back to the late 1800s that actually mention the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Mm -hmm. It actually, a lot of these traditions, they go back further than Italy because Italy has had so much change. And this is like a larger group of people practicing this. Now, there are plenty of people who come, who've come here who, who, don't, who don't practice this. And I would say that Knowing from the content that we've made, because when I started the YouTube channel, I created a bunch of seafood videos for the Feast mm -hmm. of the Seven Fishes, and they didn't do so well. And, you know, there wasn't a lot out there on YouTube at the time. There still isn't now, though the bear has did something on the Feast of the Seven Fishes recently. Oh, really? And I believe there's a movie two years ago that was made on the Feast of the Seven Fishes. There is a movie. One of our listeners wrote to us and, and let us know that there is a movie. I have not seen it. I think it would be fun to watch when we have some time to yeah. do that. Um, what we did find- So which, it is in popular culture. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. What we did find, and I'll read this. I, I'm sorry that I'm not able to cite where this came from. It's kind of like a, it almost looks like a scanned I screenshotted document. that from Facebook about five years ago. So okay. I don't know and believe the person who was sharing it was just sharing it in one of the Italian, it, uh, honestly, there's a lot of info in these Italian uh, mm -hmm. recipe Facebook groups. A ton of, uh, Facebook is an older platform. M most users are over 50 years old. In fact, many users are 70 plus, and they are sharing all these old school recipes all the time and discussing this. So that's where this came from. All right, so I'm just gonna read this. Yeah, read it word for word. Okay, the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Italian families throughout the world enjoy the Feast of the Seven Fishes on Christmas Eve. Each dish is intended to celebrate the impending birth of Christ. The feast begins with shellfish because in olden days, crustaceans were the food for the very poor, and Christ's life spoke of, to the importance of even the lowest of God's creatures. Clams and mussels in white or red sauce served over pasta is a must, as is shrimp and scallops. Next comes bacala, salt-cured cod, in an aromatic stew. Cod, until more recently, was the most common of fish and a mainstay of the diet poor. Okay. Then there is squid or calamari, or if you are from New York City, calamad. That's right. Right? Calamad. That's right. Good. That's, that's, good my, imper that's my impersonation. Good pronunciation. Okay. As it is known in the cucina, sliced into rings, dipped in egg and flour, then deep fried. The squid's many swirling tentacles represent the many different directions that Christ's teachings went throughout the world. Eel is served lightly dusted with flour and fried or roasted. This fast-moving citizen of the sea <laughs> symbolizes the speed with which the word of Christ spread. Then comes the tiny whole smelts dipped in flour and deep fried. They signify that the smallest and most humble of fish are pleasing to God. Served with lemon, they are also most pleasing to people. I've heard them described as like fishy French fries. Yes. I've never had them myself. Rounding off the feast is a good soft white fleshed fish such as poached whiting. Whiting has always been abundant and easily available to everyone. Okay, so that's this little excerpt here that explains seven different fishes. So that's really good. And I think this is a good way to take it. And I actually think we can talk about dishes for each each one here. We can kind of use this as our roadmap. So this is a good roadmap. Mm -hmm. I will say that you you like kind of raised your eyebrows when uh, you were talking about uh, bacala. Okay, you were saying, okay, so next comes bacala, salt cured cod in an aromatic stew. Cod, until most recently, was the most common of fish and a mainstay of the diet poor. So that is the case. So I raised I raised my eyebrow because I wasn't sure if I, if the diet poor, if that was like a correct- Oh, you mean poor of diet or poor? It's hard to know. I believe it meant like impoverished people ate cod. That's I believe that's the case yeah, too. Yeah, so, but I wasn't sure with the way that was worded. I Like usually the um, 
in English, the adjective would come before the yeah. noun. Yeah. So again, this is probably right. written a uh, hundred years ago by somebody from you know Sicily who's you know learned the language. Mm-hmm. If I uh, Ameri- you know learned English five years later, um, cod is is it used to be and just isn't anymore a, a dish for poor. I mean, this is how they transported fish salt across the cod. O- salt cod. How salt they, cod. Yeah, salt cod. Just so, just so you know, bacala is salted cod. There's actually in Spanish, Portuguese food, they also do the same process too. I think too. it's called bacalao. Yeah, bacalao. And then also in um, you know Norwegian, Scandinavian cooking, they use... Uh, lutefisk, which is, they make lutefisk, which is made out of it's lie in it. a different type of fish. No, it's not cod, not right? Sure or is it cod? It, I think it is still cod. Cod is just this abundant fish that was perfect for catching, salting, and taking with you across the ocean. So yeah, back then when this was written, it was diet poor. But right now when you're trying, trying to buy cod, if you want to make cod, and I really want to say, if you are doing the Feast of the Seven Fishes, it's Really, where I think it starts and stops is at Bacala. I don't think you can really say you had a real feast of the seven fishes without including at least one Bacala dish. Do you agree with that, Tara? I would agree because I feel like Bacala is the symbol of the feast of the seven fishes. Um, it's if you go to any store in this area anywhere, around, in any, December, anywhere where there's Italian mm-hmm. immigrants and they have like pork stores or uh, Costco even has it. Yeah, even Costco here sells it, but they it's not going to be in probably other parts of America. By the way, a pork store, which people are confused when I say that, that is an extremely common term. That is actually what people call it. They call it a pork store. You don't go mm-hmm. say, I'm going to my Italian butcher. Or, you, yes, it's a kind of like an Italian specialty store. Yeah, but so it, here I say, you just say pork store. I always say specialty store for, for the non-New York, New Jersey audience here. Um, they would have it too, even though they're not a seafood place. So, and it's on the shelf. It's a shelf stable it, fish. Shelf it's stable. not refrigerated. So that's why you can order it from Amazon. If you really want to make this, you want. We have two recipes, two different recipes on our website. We have bacala napolitana. So that is the most commonly found dish. That's the one that most people think of. And then we also have um, we made fritters. We did a fritters, which is also another common way to do it. One of the other common ways would be a salad that I need to put up on the site, but Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to get to it in time. If you do get bacala, and it's going to run you about $20 a pound, which again, this is like, you're like, Jim, Jim, what's going on here? There's supposed to be a poor man's fish. It's not, it's just not anymore. And you know, you try to order it on Amazon, it might be $30 a pound, unfortunately. Yeah. But you don't need a lot of it, and especially if you make the fritters, because the fritters you're mixing with uh, potato, and uh, you know it's like to bulk it up. So then that's again, you know, a, a thing of the poor. You know, add the potatoes, add the breadcrumbs, add, add the rice in there to to bulk it up. Mm-hmm. That was a little tangent on on salt cod bacala, which again is probably the signifies this feast of the seven fishes more than any other ingredient. Tara wants to discuss you. So Tara, you have some like a notes you made about other dishes that are common. Yeah. So I have not necessarily dishes, but other seafood items that maybe not were not mentioned in that excerpt I read. And then after that, I think we can go into some of our favorites to make. And when we do go into that, I really want you to explain a little bit more about bacala and how to prepare it because there is, you know, several day several days long process yeah. involved in it but let's get into that in a okay. minute right now i wanted to just point out some some things that were not referenced in that um excerpt i just read one of them is scungeal or scungeal squingeal you know it's basically conch right yes. if you've ever been to the caribbean you probably had conch it's the large shell it's basically like a large sea snail um, that's often found or included in seafood salads. Absolutely, right? As also with like a seafood sauce that's served with with pasta. Absolutely, um, that you can usually find canned. Definitely, in and it's, any Italian specialty store. And, and it's good. It's not that cheap though. The better brands canned are still fairly expensive. 
But once you get a canned version, it's like kind of like using canned clams for linguine a la vongole. It, it's still really good. Mm-hmm. The Italian exporting companies, and there's a whole bunch of them, they compete with each other. Cento is one of the biggest ones. They basically have a line of 200 things that they sell, and that's one of them. And you can find them, and they're, and they're good. Mm-hmm. You can make a nice, nice. You can make a seafood sauce with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing that's commonly on the menu that's not referenced in there, and probably because it's on the pricier side right now, is lobster. Lobster is always on the pricier side. Lobster is not. I would easily say omit the lobster for people that are trying to make this. You know, if you got ten people coming over, if you got twenty people, this could get very expensive mm-hmm. quickly. For sure. So lobster is one I would probably omit. Though at Costco, and Costco is your friend for all these ingredients, they do sell, they do have good prices on frozen tails. Mm -hmm. And you could do a bunch of them. You could do them oregano style, fra diablo, really whatever way you want. Yeah. And then another item that wasn't on here is octopus or pulpo. So we don't do octopus. We don't have recipes. It's not, it's just not something we make. And, you know, I don't really want to go into the reasons too much. I'll, maybe, maybe I'll let Tara explain, right? You, why don't you want me to make it? I don't know. I, I've i learned that oct- octopi, is that right? <laughs> they are highly intelligent yeah. creatures. And, you know, I know for- As our, opposed to squid. Although I believe squid are also oh, intelligent, okay. but I, I, know, yeah. I know that octopi, octopi octopuses i i don't know which is the correct one they are highly intelligent yeah. creatures and i know you know folks might be like well you so is the pig wait, so is the so cow is a pig. Yeah. i know yeah i know trust me yeah i do <laughs> i do struggle with this um but so for me i'm just i'm not comfortable yeah consuming octopus even though i have and i think it's it's deli- delicious. It's delicious. I mean, when prepared right, mm-hmm. the Greeks the Greeks obviously are very good at preparing it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one. And veal is the other one. That's not about, obviously, the seven fishes, but that's the other one that you won't really see me making. Though in our cookbook, I suppose I will have to put some veal recipes on there. You it's, eat veal. I eat I veal. I just don't eat it, it. The problem is I can't be making these dishes for like, you know, getting an octopus and getting a bunch of veal and then the family doesn't eat it. So that's kind of the thing here. We've discussed this a lot. We're actually a family. Like, we're not a fake family. This is, it's like the food that I make is normally for four or six people, the recipes on our site. And yeah, we have no intention of throwing that food out after I make it. We have been packing on the pounds a little bit from all the beef recipes I've been making lately, you know? Yeah, that's not good. (laughs) Hey, if people wanted the healthy food, I would make some of it because I think everybody can eat a little bit more healthy food. It's just that every time I attempt anything like that, it does not do well with you. You, who's who's listening right now or watching. It Mm -hmm. it doesn't. Maybe you say you like it or maybe you go to somebody else for it. Maybe you say, Mm -hmm. Jim's only good for the fattening food. He's not good for the healthy food. But- Mm -hmm. You know, I digress. I'd like to talk about our favorite seven fishes dishes. <laughs> Struggling with say seven it's fishes dishes. It's hard to dishes. say. The fi- fishes dishes. Try yeah. saying that five times in a row. Yeah. So let's talk about some of our favorite dishes to make for the feast okay. for Christmas Eve. And do you want me to rattle them off? Rattle them yeah, off, and- or I can talk about them as you do them. I mean, you know, if you want to discuss discuss the intricacies of a dish, you take it, or I can take it, obviously. Yeah, Yeah. so I'm gonna start with some items that could be considered appetizers. I'm not kind of going in order of what was read about, you know, from start to finish. That's fine. Um, Appetizers, baked clams. Clams are regonata, perfect. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and they last a long time too, so. We'll get into it at the end, uh, a little, just a couple, we'll do a few minutes on it about how to make a successful dinner because you're making all this food, you want it to be okay. That's part of the what you cook is going to be, I think you should try to figure out what will 
la- what will be good an hour later after it's been sitting around. Mm-hmm. A baked clam definitely fits that category. Definitely, because you just pop them in the oven. Yeah. Yep. Shrimp scampi or shrimp franchise? So shrimp franchise is a little difficult for a novice cook, and it will be difficult for even an experienced cook when you're trying to prepare all these other dishes. Is that because it needs to be egged and battered? Egged and battered, it's a messy affair, and you really can't do it in advance. All right. So Because like shrimp, unlike chicken, you know, you could do chicken franchise, and then you could reheat it. If you try reheating the shrimp, it's not going to be nearly as good. Mm-hmm. What about shrimp scampi? Is that a little bit more doable? Shrimp scampi is a little bit more doable, and shrimp scampi, I think you can make a big bunch of it and then put it in a sterno. I would do, you know, again, this depends on how many people you have, but a nice full sterno, do a, so do a half sheet in there. So you got a half side with shrimp scampi. You'll be you'll be able to fit like three pounds of shrimp in there easily, maybe maybe four pounds, and that will be enough for each person to get five shrimp. Which you know people are going to be kind of like they're going to be grazing on this. Mm-hmm. They're they're not going to just like pile a massive plate. They'll probably have like one thing, then they'll probably go back and have another thing. That's where sternos are are a good mm-hmm. a good thing. And I but shrimp scampi. It will be fine an hour later. It won't be as good as the first two minutes you make it, obviously, but it'll still be really good. Calamari, galamad, salad, or fried calamari. Either one of those I know can be on the menu, but which of those do you prefer or do you think people should do both? So they're both excellent. We're actually going to save my favorite calamari version. Actually, we'll probably do two calamari uh, recipes for the cookbook. And that's going to be fried calamari arrabbiata. And that's the way it's done in all these Italian restaurants here in the New York area. They will fry it and then they'll take this like kind of like thick cherry pepper sauce and toss it with some basil leaves and like a ton of garlic. And it's just the most delicious, amazing thing ever. You're going to love it. It'll be in the cookbook. But the other one in the cookbook will also be stuffed calamari. That one could be done very easily for the Feast of the Seven Fishes because calamari is great in the sense that it can only be cooked two ways. And what two ways are those, Tara? Either really fast or really slow. Why is that? I would guess that it has to do with the texture of squid in general. Yeah. And that if you cook it, if you mean to cook the calamari quickly, like a frying, and you over fry it, it can get very tough. If you want to no, you're make pretty, it stuffed and like stew it, then it needs to go for a long time. You're right. I mean, it gets- But I don't know the science behind it. I don't know the science either. I'm sure Serious Eats wrote a 900 page dissertation on it, but it basically it's, if you braise it, it will get softer. I guess the proteins, the chains, whatever, will relax and it'll get softer. So that's where the stuffed comes in. You will always braise the stuffed. So the stuffed you can prepare ahead of time, uh, make a delicious Sicilian style stuffing with breadcrumbs, raisins, pine nuts, garlic, parsley. Um, I made a video for this and I lost the audio or something like four years ago when I was on my doing all these Feast of the Seven Fishes dishes. But put it in there, you take a toothpick, you close it up, you take your calamari, all of them. So, and Oh, one important thing for this, I recommend you do, use the small tubes. Don't use yeah. like the five pound squid that, you know, can like kill your cat, you know, like use like a little <laughs> tiny one that like is about three inches long because they're more tender to begin with. And they're nicer because each person then can just take one or two. If you do a, if you do a huge squid, and I'm not saying you can't, but if you do a huge squid, it's going to take longer to braise, mm-hmm. and you're going to have like you're going to have to slice it in these big pieces, and a lot of the stuffing is going to fall out. It's much better for for your guests just to grab one or two of them. I agree. But all you do is you pan sear those, and then you make a delicious sauce, and then you put them in there, in there, and you just braise them until they're tender. It'll be about 45 minutes on the smaller tubes. It will take over an hour if you do a large one. So that's that, and then you know the ones that are on our site are fried calamari, which we got a, we got a very minimal dusting calamari, so it's like a thin batter. If you like a yeah. thick batter, use a different recipe. Yeah, so you just fry it for like 60, 90 seconds, that's all it needs, especially, again, use a smaller calamari. I, you know, when you go to a restaurant and you get those 
gigantic hoops. They look like onion rings. Mm -hmm. what, what comes, what do you think when that happens to you when you go to a restaurant? I don't like that type of calamari at all. And recently I went to an Italian restaurant here on Long Island. I won't say the name of it, but I was really disappointed that that's what they brought to me. I, I feel like those are like mass produced, like not even real. I, I don't know. They're it not. Just... They're not. They're they're act. They are call. They're regular calamari. Mm -hmm. They're they come prepped like that. A lot of times they're sliced already. They get yeah. them from like the restaurant supply stores, or the distributors. In my opinion, they they get them cheaper than the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. It's all about cost savings, and they're yeah. kind of gar. They're garbage. They're not good. The consistency is not good. I if I'm gonna have fried calamari, like my I first of all, I love fried calamari. I think there's especially in the summer. I think there's nothing better yeah. than fried calamari and like a cold drink. Yep. But if I'm gonna have it, I really want two things. First of all, I want the rings and the tentacles to be small. Secondly, I want the batter to be minimal, like how you make it, just a dusting, because I don't think it really needs any more than that. If you're giving me a heavily battered, like a like a batter you'd use for like fish and chips, I don't want it. I tend to agree with you, Tara, but where I differ is, I think it is good also with a thick batter. And especially if you're gonna do the calamari arrabbiata, you need a thick batter because the sauce, it absorbs into it. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's different. Yeah. You're not. I think it's really a matter of personal preference here. When you're having calamari arrabbiata, it's not, crispy anymore because it's been sauced. No, but if you get it at a restaurant, it's that it's that like minute before it gets to your table. It still has the crunch and it has the sauce I, on it. I get it. Yeah. It's I like get uh, it. the Chinese uh uh shrimp. I know what the, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. With the I, walnuts. I get it. Yeah. But if I'm having just a plate of calamari that's fried, I don't I really don't want any batter on it. The other thing I want to say about calamari is that for years I would only eat the rings because the tentacles kind of freaked me out with the way they <laughs> look. Fast forward, I've discovered that the tentacles are in fact the best part. Yeah, they're better. They are better. Their texture is better. If you like, if you don't like the texture of calamari rings, you think it's too rubbery for you, try the tentacles because they're not rubbery at all, especially if they're prepared correctly. And they're the best tasting and the best textured. If you do buy calamari and it's bigger, so what, what do I mean by big? Define big, Jim. Okay, so it would be a tube, you know, the squid will be, say it's 12 to 18 inches. That's fairly big. That's gonna give you rings that are about three inches in diameter, maybe a tiny bit, maybe even towards four inches. That's a big squid, okay? That squid could weigh two and a half pounds. So when you go to like fish counter, you know, you're gonna buy one of them. I don't recommend you do this, but if you do, if you do, if that's what you got, that's what you got. So the, the tentacles will be tremendous. So what you got, what you should do is just cut the tentacles into pieces before you fry them. Don't fry a tentacle that's six inches long. Really simple. I got a video on it. I show you how to remove the beak, which you know a lot of times it will have it in there. That's it's just like the clear plastic thing that is not edible. So it's really simple stuff. I I think you can make it. I think you'll if you haven't made it, you'll have like this epiphany or a sense of confidence that you just checked off something else on your list. Really simple. You either cook it super quick or you cook it a long time. That's it. Now, there is one more calamari dish, and Tara, you want to talk about it. That's the calamari salad. That's often yeah. not just a calamari salad. It's often a seafood salad. It'll have mm -hmm. not just calamari in it. Yeah. I think the version we have on the website is just calamari. Yeah. Um, there's celery in it. There's a few other things. Olives. Olives, that's right. I think red pepper, yep. like roasted red pepper. In my opinion, this is one of the best things you can make because you make it ahead of time. And the more longer it sits there, I'm not talking for like a week. No, <laughs> no, want, honestly, some uh, places do well, let it sit for a okay, week. I'm, I'm I saying remember that like, guy in that supermarket, he's like, he, yeah. like, they had this like big bowl of it. He's like, do you want some of my calamari salad? And I was just like, <laughs> I said to Tara, I go, I go, how long has this guy been doing that for? You know, like I feel like I was there four days ago and he was still and he was tossing it. Yeah, I don't I I don't recommend eating a calamari salad that's been sitting there for a week. What I'm saying is if you make it the day before, 
it's going to get even better because it's going to sit there and it's going to meld with all the other flavors. And it's a really good dish if you are maybe going to visit somebody on Christmas Eve and you're not hosting because it travels really well. Um, But if you are the one that's hosting, it's something you can make the day before and scratch off your list. I think it's the best dish, the easiest dish for your Feast of the Seven Fishes. I would definitely include that and I would definitely include baked clams. Those are two super easy make-ahead dishes. Let's move on to the next one. I have mussels marinara or mussels in a white wine sauce. These are both good and mussels will last. They will be fine sitting there. So if you have them on a warm sterno, really good, really easy to make. Biggest thing you're going to have to deal with with mussels, and this can be when you get them cheap or you get them from a real expensive place. It's cleaning them properly. You got to do a good scrub on your muscles and you have to remove what, Tara? The beard. What is the beard? It's like a fibrous thing that grows on the outside of the muscle. What is the beard used for? What does the muscle use a beard for? I think they use it to attach to things. Is that right? right? That's right. It's kind of gross. So maybe I told this story. Maybe I haven't. You're going to hear it again right now. We went to probably the most famous of all restaurants in Newport, Rhode Island. Right, Tara? Yes. And we went there for lunch. And we ordered a bowl of their famous mussels with baguette. And what did every single mussel have? (laughs) It had a beard on it. I'm telling you, You I couldn't eat mussels for like two years after that. Yeah, you were so mad. I I was so angry. Yeah. Place, I think this somebody, place has like two Michelin stars or something. Yeah, somebody messed up. Somebody messed up that day. Yeah. I think pasta and more specifically the pasta that you would serve with seafood, yeah. like a linguine, needs to be made and served right away. Right? Yeah. I mean, it can, it, you, look, if you're doing linguine with clam, canned clams, I mean, you can let it sit in a sterno. You're probably going to have to add a little bit more liquid as yeah. it dries out. That's it. Okay. I think it could be done. I want you to not be intimidated about this process. In fact, the more I'm talking about it here with you, it's not, this isn't an intimidating thing. What is bad to do is to not use sternos again, because then you're going to have cold food everywhere, and then your guests are going to be in a situation where they have to ask you to use the microwave, and that is the last thing you want. You know, like I told you, I think this was for the Thanksgiving, leading up to the Thanksgiving, you always see like the celebrity chef or whatever with all the food on their table and they're like dinner is served and like that's just for a photo Mm that's it's the food's cold so i know according to what i read earlier the last thing that's supposed to be served is like a white fish so the few that i have here i have cod like filet of sole is another one flounder right but i think cod is the one that's most often served and then there's also I don't know if, I don't think swordfish is considered a white fish. Swordfish is more like a steak fish. And then there's also salmon, which I think is less traditional. So salmon, if you want to include a pasta and swordfish together, we don't have the recipe on the site, but there is a video for us. That's Sicilian swordfish uh, eggplant mm-hmm. pasta. Yeah. That's really good. You could potentially do that. You could also do the same dish with tuna. Uh, you know, as far as which fish here, I think you go with whatever fish is affordable to you. That's fresh. Ask the person. I, I, I would make that, a, a lot of people here are not using whiting. They're using, what are they using, Tower? most of the time? I would say cod or flounder. Flounder. Yeah. Flounder. Yeah. People are obsessed with flounder. They have flounder everywhere at the stores, like flounder, and it's always on sale. Yeah. We have a stuffed flounder. Take a look at that one. You could prepare that in advance, and then you could put them in the oven when it's time to eat. Fried flounder we have, you can fry up a bunch of flounder and you could just leave them in the sterno, you know? They'll do okay that way. They might dry mm-hmm. out a little bit. But, you know, serve a little lemon wedges, some tartar sauce with that. Salmon oreganata, simple, will last last a long time in the sterno. Yeah, I feel like salmon does well in the sterno. Yeah. yeah. Last but not least, and I saved this one for last because I consider, I consider this to be the cheat code okay. for the seven fishes. It's a whole bunch of those seafood items all in one dish. And this dish is delicious. It's Zupa de Pesh. Oh, Zupa de Pesh, yep. And that has cod, right? Mussels, clams, shrimp, calamari. Yeah. Five. 
five of them right there yeah, in so that's one a, dish. That's a seafood soup. That's the popular one here in New York. The other one in California, which is very similar, is called what, Tara? Chopino. Chopino. Now, there's some differences. I think Chopino uses Zambuca and fennel in it, possibly. Well, Zuba de Pesh has, your recipe for Zuba de Pesh has fennel in it. Yeah, I did put fennel in the one that 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 I made. And I wasn't, you know, I kind of just developed this one. I wasn't taking it from a restaurant around here. Every restaurant around here will do it different. Some of them will serve, they'll call it Zupa de Pesh and they'll still serve it over pasta, which isn't really supposed to be. It's supposed to be a, a Zupa, meaning soup of, of seafood. Mm-hmm. Um, Does it have you know, Dungeness crab in it? Dungeness crab, I believe, is a part of Chopino. Yeah, that's because where. if it's from that's San California. Francisco, yeah. that's where that type of crab is in abundance. Yeah, and you know, can we tell them about the book or not? Or we don't want to give we that away. We started talking we did about, talk it. about it. Yeah, okay. we didn't say we haven't what la- it's going to be about. We haven't but. landed exactly on the book. First of all, the book now is, it's at the point now where a publisher is going to be looking at, but basically the idea is it's not going to be a utility book. It's not going to be 150 recipes. You don't need a utility book. You already have a utility. You have our YouTube cooking videos. That's There's almost 300 of them. And our website, there's 500 recipes that I think we have the best website around. I, I think ours is better, more instructional than any other website out there. So I know maybe you're like, well, Jim, I want all those just in book form. That's not what we're going to do here. We're going to try to do more of an informational book, some more history, and then try to highlight some dishes from different areas. And one of those, like we're going to pick the Italian American communities across the country. And one of the dishes that's probably the only one I really think of when I think of Italian in California would be Chopino, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. So that one's being saved because these book publishers, they won't let you have, you know, they won't let you take all the recipes from your website. So I got to save, I got to hold some of these recipes back, Mm -hmm. but that's a good one to make. And there's a lot of recipes out there for it online. They all have Zambuca, I believe, I believe. So I just want to say there are a lot more seafood recipes on our website, on the YouTube channel that you can look at. You can also use Google and find uh, a variety of recipes for this. Eel, we don't have a recipe. We probably never will have a recipe for eel, okay? That's not something that I see myself making anytime soon. Before we move into questions, Jim, can you share with our listeners some tips for a successful seafood feast on Christmas Eve. Yeah, so maybe this is the most important part of this episode here. Uh, Tip number one, and it's always tip number one for any time you're having a holiday get-together where you're having more than four people, let's say. When you're having people that aren't your family members, like your immediate family members, like your extended family. You sternos, you sternos. What, Tara? You (laughs) sternos. You sternos. Yeah, I mean, Uncle Bob is going to be, you know, in the other room telling war stories or whatever. And, you know, other people are going to be all over the place. Some people might be outside. Uh, Cousin Timmy might be doing arm wrestling matches in the other room. (laughs) There might be all all these people that you can't get to the table right away. And even if you could get them to the table, you sternos, they're going to save you so much of a headache. It's a one-time investment besides the fuel. Buy the fuel, use it. As far as like what dishes to do, I basically, I would say if you really, if you're trying to do a feast of the seven fishes, you got to include bacala, but you can do two dishes with the bacala. So that's, that's good. So that kind of gets rid of two. Definitely do baked clams, right? Mm-hmm. And then definitely do what? Zupa de Pesh. No, the seafood salad too, though, Oh, the right? seafood salad, yeah. Okay, so now you're saying Zupa de Pesh, so now we're at six. Well, I'm saying Zupa de Pesh because yeah. you've got five fishes in, yep. in one, and if you want to observe the seven thing, yeah. do so that. Then, so we did six, now we only need one more. What would be your number one? Mm-hmm. I think we got to do a regular fish, but but we didn't have mussels, though. The fish or is, shrimp scampi. The fish is in the Zupa de Pesh. There's cod in that. Okay, I'm going to eliminate one of the bacala. We're just going to do bacala napolitana, mm-hmm. Okay. So now we have two choices left. I'm going to say shrimp scampi because everybody loves shrimp scampi. Yeah, that's really a good one. And then I would do like like a simple fish that will yeah. that will stay well on the sterno. I think a salmon is is good. I though I know it's not traditional, but I know everybody pretty much likes salmon. Yeah. 
and it's foolproof kind of in that it's so fatty that you can't really overcook it. Yes, Tara's dead right on that. Tara, why, now what fit, What salmon wouldn't you use though for this? Well, a wild salmon, right? Well, wild does have fat, but it's one particular type of salmon that does, it has oh, no fat. Oh, the king fat. salmon? No, it's, um, and it's eluding me right now, it's um, sockeye. Oh, yes. Sockeye has no fat. That's right. It's like sockeye's it, that's zero very, fat. That's, is that very like deep red? Deep almost? red, they sell it in the store. Yeah, so. we've had it before, yeah. but it's yeah. Good. I mean, it's good, you just, you know, it's not it's not gonna do well sitting there versus mm -hmm. the salmon that Tara's talking about. And we use a lot of farm salmon. We yeah, do. I know people can give us flack about that. I'm unapologetic about that. Mm -hmm. You know, sorry, that's what that's what I use, and I try to make dishes for for everyone, not for you know just a few people that can afford twenty five dollar pound salmon. I I don't know. Maybe I've just been brainwashed my whole life. I just I can't fork over that much for salmon. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope you make it. And if you do make any of the dishes, let us know how they are. Leave a comment. Actually, just leave a comment. This is provided you're watching the YouTube uh, version. Leave a comment and then let us know what your menu is going to look like. We didn't talk about smelts either. And really quickly about smelts, you batter them, you fry them, you eat them. Squeeze some lemon on them. That's it. I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. It's it's a simple thing. You could fry the whole thing. You're not right. You don't. You're not taking anything out of them. They're t they're super tiny. Yeah, I think you eat the whole, you eat all the bones. It's like yeah, an you eat the heads, everything. Yeah, yeah. that's which is what I figured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you there. I mean, you can dust them in corn starch, flour, whatever. Super easy. It's like fried calamari. In fact, if you're going to do fried calamari, save your oil and fry your smelts. Yeah, that's a good tip. Definitely do that. Mm -hmm. All right, Jim. I have two questions. I'm gonna. Well, one of them is is I think quick. Although knowing you, you'll probably turn it into a long winded answer. She looks mad when she's saying that. You definitely looked a little, a little, a little perturbed right there. Well, because I know how you are. You're verbose. We get complaints all the time in the cooking videos. You, you, you talk too much, and I just, you know, they write like a whole like dissertation to me. I just write one word. I write TikTok. <laughs> That's what I write. I write TikTok. But a podcast is talking. Yeah. And so we don't get the comments on the podcast saying you talk too much. That would be weird. That's true. Because people expect you to talk. They expect you. Because people want a certain length because they're watching or they're listening while they're cooking or driving mm -hmm. on their commute. That's true. So this is a quick question, I think. But again, expand on it as you see fit. When, this is from Tom. When should I use sea salt and when should I use kosher salt? Most of the questions about this are from, you know, from... Europe or whatnot, because I don't think kosher salt is sold in Europe. They don't know what it is. They always ask, what is kosher salt? Anyway, Tom, kosher salt is great because it's the size of it. You know, traditionally kosher salt is used for koshering, but that's not what chefs are using. That's not what 99.9% .9 of chefs are using it for. They're using it because it's inexpensive and you can grab it. It's uh, coarse, so you can distribute it more uh, evenly on your food. The two main brands of kosher salt are Diamond Kosher and Morton's Kosher Salt. I, for a long time, was using Morton's, and really the reason I was using it simply was because it's harder to find Diamond Kosher Salt. It just is. Most restaurants all use Diamond because they get it from the restaurant supply store or the distributor that comes to the restaurant and says, says to the head chef, what do you want today? And he says, I need a, cr a crate of Diamond Kosher. But I wasn't, I wasn't recommending it for that reason. That all being said, Diamond Kosher is a superior product. It's it's a far superior product. It's lighter. It's it just distributes easily. So if say like you're seasoning a pot roast or you know a big steak rib roast, it's awesome. I recommend it. That's what I've have switched to. Don't worry though. I explain always the difference in what the size is. Okay, one teaspoon table salt equals two teaspoons Diamond Kosher. One teaspoon table salt equals one and a half teaspoons Morden's kosher salt. So diamond takes is the lightest of them. Okay, that's it. That's all you got to know. As far as salt, sea salt, sea salt's a great product. It's more expensive. You can buy some less expensive versions now. Sea salt I use when I need fine salt, especially when I'm baking, because I don't want something that's coarse. Mm -hmm. I want it to be 
the distribute immediately into my dough. Say like I'm making pizza. Like I would never say use kosher salt for pizza dough. So you're talking about fine sea salt. There are other types of sea salt. Yes, like Malden sea salt, mm-hmm. which There's is very flaky big. Sea flaky sea salt, which I would say that should be used for finishing. Yeah, so like, that's more. That's the most expensive of the yeah. salts. So I would use that to finish a salad. We use it on the orange and fennel salad. I would use it on top of if you're making chocolate chip cookies. I knew you were going to say that. Because that's my favorite thing. I would definitely put flaky sea salt on that. It's good on steak, right? If you want to finish a steak with that. Um, and then there's there are other types like Himalayan. That's pink. Pink it's just salt. Pink. Yeah. But that's not. I, I don't know if he's asking about that. There are a bunch of different types. Bunch there's of different like Celtic types. sea salt. Yeah. Salt, uh, so for the fine the fine salt what that I can buy, you can buy Morden's fine uh, sea salt. Just use that if you want to like, you know, for pasta water or whatnot, if you don't want to waste your kosher. Normally I just use kosher for, for everything now, mm-hmm. uh, except for the examples that Tara uh, yeah. went over. Next question is from Mary. This is in response to our episode where we talked about dinner parties. So Mary said, dinner parties sound like some magical scary realm where you have to talk to others, look them in the eye and be realistic. What are your pro tips to novices who haven't done a dinner party or haven't been to one in so long that they don't even know where to start? Um, So I have a few things. I mean, obviously we go into great detail into what to serve yeah. at dinner parties in that episode, if you want to check that out. I know, Mary, I know you did listen to that one. Um, but as far as tips, these are mine. I would say keep it small, right? I would say maybe even under 10 people. Um, invite people who you know will get along with each other. Now, a dinner party is not the same as like a holiday. A holiday gathering, you are almost obligated to have your family members there. And to get into fights. You're not obligated to get into fights. They just sometimes happen. Um, A dinner party, you can certainly be a little bit more selective. I sometimes think a dinner party might be for a group of friends who you will get along. It might be for a group of coworkers, or maybe worlds will collide and you'll have some friends and coworkers. But I would say try and invite the people who you know will get along with each other because a dinner party is for you to enjoy too. You know, you want to sit there and you want to have a conversation with these folks and you want them to all kind of, you want there to not be any drama, right? So I, that's why I would say try and try and invite the people who you know will get along. Maybe they share some common beliefs. They're not on opposing sides of controversial uh, topics. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 tough, though. Every, the, the world is divided. Yeah, but if you're having a dinner party, like I said, you can be selective about who you are having. I would also say to keep your dinner party as informal as possible. Like, don't feel like you have to put out your best china. Like, you can have mismatched plates if you want. In fact, I like mismatch plates. I do too. I think it's it's cozy. I like French mismatched, bistro style. Yes, I like mismatched glasses. Um, the other thing that I that I like to do is I like to save. If you get a clear bottle of wine, you can save that clear bottle and you can fill it with water and you can have different bottles scattered everywhere so everybody can easily access. That's a great idea. Um, water at any time. Great idea. Yeah, Tara. but I would say like don't don't. I love s- when restaurants do that. Yeah, don't sweat the small stuff. Stuff can be mismatched and napkins can be mismatched. Maybe if you want to use like cloth napkins, which are a nice touch, use mismatched ones. So Tara, I want to say that that water tip is is great because you know restaurants do that now, and I think you would assume like ten years ago, twenty years ago, you go to a restaurant, a restaurant did that to you, you'd be like, oh, this restaurant stinks. Like they not even going to fill my water when I need it. But now, it's it's actually a sign that they that they care about you. Maybe they have less faith that their busser or their waiter will refill your water for you. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great idea, especially, I mean, if you're doing a dinner party, you don't have that. Now you can hire one person for your dinner party, which that's something Tara didn't go into. Now you Mm -hmm. you are getting a little bit more expensive here, but I think you could probably find someone who 
you know, you're probably going to have to pay them $30 an hour. You're not going to be able to be like, hey, come over for $750. You know, like, I'm going to pay you below minimum wage. No, you got to make it worth their while. Or I would say just do a minimum for the night. So if they're going to help you for four hours, maybe you pay them $150, maybe $200. And, you know, they're there to help you. They're not there to eat your food or to drink, get wasted. You know, like, they're they're like, they're help. <laughs> Ideally, you don't want a friend doing this. You want someone you don't know. And, uh, who knows? You know, that might might help really help you. The other thing that Tara didn't go into, she did she did briefly mention on it that they she wants them to get along with each other. But more importantly, you want someone who's not going to insult your food. So it's fine for people to say, you know, how they feel. But remember, number one, they're not paying. You're not a restaurant, you know, you're not charging them for it. Mm -hmm. You're doing this out of the kindness of your heart. You're the one hosting it. You know, when was the last time they hosted a dinner party for you? So I would just make sure the people you're inviting aren't that argumentative, criticizing type. Criticism's fine outside of the dinner party when it's maybe the next day or a week later if you ask them by themselves, but not at the thing where they take a bite and they go, this is crap. Yeah, but I think if you're having a dinner party, you have control. You are curating the group that you're having. Yeah, but you don't know how they're going to behave always. And they, you know, a lot when of al times alcohol you do. is involved. A it lot of times you do. A lot of times these are your close friends or coworkers. And you know how they are with each other. And you can kind of view, I, I hate to say the word safe space, but you can kind of make it a safe space for yourself. Yeah, and maybe you can try to ban politics because that could be, you know, uh, otherwise then you got to get eight people that think exactly alike about everything, which is silly too. So, you know, that could be, that could be a sticking point. The other tip I would say, especially if it's for this time of the year, and it's something that Scandinavian cultures, especially those in Denmark, practice, and that is embrace candlelight. Candlelight makes everything yeah. feel warm and cozy, and it gives you just that really, really good feeling. So as much as you can, light candles as all over the house, all over the apartment, and just try and give your folks like a warm and cozy space. That sounds great. I think we should leave it on that. Yeah, and I am curious to hear from you, our audience, if you have tips for dinner parties that you've done or that we missed, let us know. Yes, definitely let us know. And to let us know, leave your comments at podcast at sipandfeast.com. We will see you next time.